Adam Dressel is a teacher out of the Raleigh area in North Carolina. And my stepdaughter was going to his meetings. They had a nice jihad up there. And she wanted to introduce me to this fellow. And she did. And we got along really good in a long distance correspondence. In, in the meantime, I had gone up to visit him and his group several times, and we got to know each other well. I asked him as a futurist, I said, let's have a debate, a friendly debate in 2014 on uh, the mystery is history. I'll take the historical viewpoint. You can take the futurist viewpoint. And we'll have a friendly debate and see where we get. Well, we did that. He, 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 he bit. And I still have the recording of that. I looked at it uh, a couple of weeks ago. It's like a comedy of errors. You know how much trouble we used to have when we were using Meat Cheap and Uvu and all those. It would usually take us 25 minutes just to get a meet meeting going because the hookups were so bad or the noises were so loud. And so we had a debate, and uh, it was really inconsequential. But he is like a rat or a terrier on rats when it comes to Bible mysteries. He was intrigued about the historical viewpoint or preterist viewpoint. And uh, he has always got to know the truth or he's got to at least come to an idea of the truth, usually through studying. Again, this is Adam Dressel. So since that time, 2014, when we had that debate, he told me, you've got to dot every I and cross every T to prove to me that revelation is history. Well, I didn't have to do that. I just went through a couple of chapters with him online. And in the meantime, he's been writing a secret book that is ready to be published now. And that book is a full exposition of revelation from a historical viewpoint. That is, using Josephus and whatever other types of historical material from the time he could find as well as logic and the New Testament to, well, we'll say prove that revelation is history and that we don't have to fear dragons and beasts and all kinds of calamities and asteroids coming down and all that. It's already done. So he, just in the last couple of weeks, sent out... Um, he sent out an e-copy of his book, ready Hello? to publish. Hey, um, I got a thing from Yahoo telling you what an account key is for um, maybe your Yahoo email or something. Did you ask for one? Yeah, Ooh. I can't get on my Instagram. Okay. Amanda, you're not muted. That's uh, Sherry. Oh, Sherry. Sherry Gamble's on. Anyway, where was I? Uh, so he sent me a copy. I sent one up to Governor to take a look at it, see if he could find anything in there. And I've read just the introduction and the first chapter, and I've got two-thirds of the foreword done. He's wanting it done so he can publish it. But it's a masterwork. It is a masterwork. If you folk are interested in getting um, a pre-publication PDF, now, Rush is reading it, too. Good for you. If you would like a PDF, he gave me permission to pass this out to a few people that would read through it and give us an opinion of what they think. All right. What I'm going to ask you to do is to send me an email, because my memory is not like it used to be, of course. Send me an email, and in the subject area, just say, I want it. I want it, all right? And I'll send it over to you. I don't know how long it'll take to publish, but what I've read of it, it is a masterwork. It's a Opus Dei. 
It's a work of Elohim. And uh, my hope is, I'm not interested in convincing people of an opinion. I am interested in convincing fearful people who are still in the first stages of faith that there's nothing to worry about here, that no, uh, the world is not going to end September 23rd, but rather to, to quell their fears and anxieties about this and to speak to these prophetic evangelists who say different. Uh, Marcel was the editor of this book, did a great job. And so there it is. Send me an email. He said it was okay if I sent it out to a few people. Read it. The introduction is enough to convince you, really. Good job, Marcel. Great job. So there you have it. And tonight we're going to talk about Gary's claims. I don't know if Liz is on here or not. She couldn't get on. I didn't send her an invitation yet. Jack? Yeah. Yeah, I'm really interested in that myself. Uh, now, his name again, Mark Field? Adam Drissel? Oh, Adam Drissel. Drissel. That, that's who the, the, uh, the book is going to be published by. Yes. Okay. And just send an email that says, I want it. I want it, and I will send it over to you. Okay, I appreciate it. Understand, this is not to be passed out anywhere. Okay, I already sent you. But when he, uh, when he writes, he published, um, uh, he published, uh, is it a hexapla of the Torah a couple of years ago? with three English translations, the Latin, the Septuagint, and the Hebrew, that if you want a comprehensive guide or explanation of the Torah, that's it. This thing is a huge, fat book. Like I said, it's got <clears throat> three <clears throat> ancient languages plus three English translations. I don't know. I, I can't remember what he called it. But maybe Marcel can tell us here if she can get on uh, the microphone for a minute. It's the Comparative Language Bible. Great. It's right now he's just got the Torah finished, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Super. But that is a publication that ought to be in every serious Bible student's library. Even if you can't read the Hebrew, Greek, or Latin, you have three translations, one quite literal, that will help you get through and exegete it very thoroughly. So there are my plugs for Adam Dressel, and as far as the publication of this thing, we'll let you know as time goes on. We'll probably get him on here. He's been very hush-hush about it. But, of course, he's going to want to sell some books. Now on to Gary Wayne. I'm just going to address one of his claims tonight in short order because he's made a lot of claims regarding Essenes especially. So many that I think we could go on for days really discussing it. But it appears to me that Gary is not a fool, though he is certainly a spouting liar. That's what makes him a spouting liar, because he's smart. He's taken a variety of different literatures and histories and thrown them into a kettle and stirred them up and attributed what is poured out as a scene. The claim that I want to talk about tonight is that Essenes are polytheistic or 
actually were. Polytheism is the worship of many gods, or really at least two. What he is saying when he says Essenes are polytheists, he's saying that Jews are polytheistic, that Hebrews are polytheistic, that they are no better than Romans in regards to their theology. Romans, of course, as you know, had many gods. I remember back in seminary, we were to read an excerpt from a writing of a Roman soldier where he talked about just how the gods he served treated him. The bottom line was, he was fearful all the time. If he made one wrong move, some god was going to punish him. You know, the Roman emperors as well were very into um, gods that especially would protect them and help them to the point where even Vespasian and Titus are recorded as going to temples of Venus and to um, uh, the Greek uh, place of the Vestal Virgins to get prophecies about how they would end up, how their uh, destruction of Israel would go. And they were very concerned about that. Of course, we have today this heresy called Caesar's Messiah. A fellow wrote a book there that purports that Vespasian, Titus, Domitian, and Josephus gang together in order to write up a new religion that is Christianity that would be the opiate of the masses, which is ridiculous. However, all three of those emperors in that dynasty tried very hard to push their particular favorite gods upon the people to the point where by the first century, after 250 years of Greek overlordship, then Roman, that the majority of the Jews had come over to the Greek way of thinking, had abandoned the worship of Yahweh, and were now going to the temples that popped up all over Israel, temples of the many gods of the Romans. This is when we have in the New Testament the uh, dichotomy between the Hellenists and the Hebrews. It was a very dangerous situation for Hebrews because their borders, language, and culture had been breached to the point of Hebraic near extinction. Hold on a sec. Okay. So uh, Gary claims that the Essenes were polytheistic. I have no idea where that came from until I started thinking about it and listening to more of his stuff, the early Hebrews were very clearly henotheistic. They had many gods that they knew of, but they worshipped only one. One of the very earliest passages in the Scripture, in the Torah, is Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9. It goes back to the 13th century, so scholars say, B.C., and in order to get the earliest version of it, we have to look at it from the Dead Sea Scrolls, Deuteronomy, which I will read to you now, uh, Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9. When Elion, that's the high god, divided the nations, 
when he separated the sons of Adam, he established the borders of nations according to the number of the sons of Elohim. Yahweh's portion was his people. His his sonship inheritance. I'm sorry, I can't read my own writing there. So Elion or El Elion, El Most High, divides humankind among his children, his sons, giving each an inheritance there. So this is a good example of henotheism, believing many exist, but worshiping only one. There's another example that's very early in the Hebrew Scriptures, and that is from Job. Job may well be the earliest book in the Old Testament, and that is the idea of the council of the Elohim. If we don't understand that correctly, that there's an evolution of theology in the Scripture from the earliest times to the end of the canon, then we get a little confused, thinking that, well, the people of Jews and Hebrews still believe that there was a council up there of gods. But that comes from the earliest literature. By the time we get to the later Old Testament and through the New Testament, we find quite a different idea of theology there. So, henotheists believe many exist, but worship only one. We find an evolution, as I said, from henotheism to monotheism. By the time we get to writers like Paul, it is a true monotheism, where he says, like, for instance, in Galatians 4, 8, he speaks of gods that are no gods. So he's correcting the theology of the time from henotheism to monotheism. There's no evidence that I could find that Hebrews or Jews were ever polytheistic worshiping many gods. Perhaps polytheists came into the Hebraic movement, bringing, say, Ashtaroth or Ashter in as a consort of Yahweh, but that was from an influence of outsiders. We read a lot about that in the Kings and the Chronicles in regard to certain kings or their wives bringing in false gods from foreign places. Of course, we also read about that concerning the Levites coming back to the land from Babylon or Assyria that had married foreign wives that had different gods and different beliefs. Essenes were Hebrews and they were Jews. As we read in the historians contemporaneous with the Essenes, for I'm thinking of Josephus and Pliny especially, the Essenes were the most exemplary, most strict, and yet most pious of all the sects of Judaism, and there, there were many. These people that observe the Essenes, perhaps were part of the Essenes, they testify to what they see, the devotion, the yahad, the closeness of community, and also the unwillingness for Essenes to have those of other sects or other beliefs coming in, because there was a very strict code that allowed people to come in only after years of learning. These same historians who, hold, uh, who write about the Essenes, they wrote extensively about them. We can know them, especially again in the writings of Philo, and 
they mention nowhere that the Essenes were poly or pantheists. There's not a hint of that. Not even the heresiologists of the Christian church going on to the fourth century have made any accusations against the Essenes or their daughter sects like Nazarenes, Alcassaites, etc. Their only complaint is that they kept Torah, which was outside the religion of the Christians of that time. If you kept Torah, you were not able to be a part of the Christian church because you were not trusting Jesus for his grace to cover your sins. And Torah doing was thus sinful. One thing the Essenes were that set them apart and also make them in common with Jewish Christianity is dualism. Perhaps Gary is thinking dualism and polytheism is the same thing. Dualism, there are two significant powers in the universe, both spiritual and, to some extent, divine. Of these, one is worthy to be worshipped. The name of that Elohim is Yahweh Elohim, who, in his train, had minions of angelic beings that were basically good, that were Torah-keeping in a divine sense. Yahweh Elohim is good. The other power was Belial, the swallower, who also had minions of evil spirits doing his bidding on the earth. Belial was not to be worshipped, but cursed. Throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls especially, there are many passages of cursing of the swallower because the swallower, so they understood, had swallowed the majority of the Judaisms of that time. Belial was not to be worshipped. This is evident in the War Scroll, what they used to call the sons of light versus the sons of darkness. There is a huge dichotomy between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. I don't need to go into that. However, I can tell you that this same theology rolls over into the New Testament, especially in the Gospel of John. And also in Paul, light versus darkness, good versus evil, righteous versus unrighteousness the delimination of what is good and what is evil is always the Torah. Polytheism, as well as reincarnation, come into Gary Spouting because he's telling students that the Gnostic Gospels came out of or were utilized by Qumran, by the Essenes. He comes right out and says that. I mean, who's listening to this? Who's listening to him? Well, according to page views, many people are. And if they can't discern the difference between <coughs> Qumran religion, a dualism, and the pantheism of the Gnostics, well, how can we ever convince them? Is it worth it? The Gnostics of the Gnostic Gospels, which Gary throws in with the Dead Sea Scrolls as though they came from the same place, they had at least two gods. One was known as the Monad, that is the lonely one or the one alone. Or it was also called Shemhamphorsus, that is in Hebrew, the 72-named God. 
God with 72 names because 72 emanations of that comes out of this God and forms 72 different entities. And I've got to say, after taking a course in Kabbalah, it's a very similar to that kind of understanding. This is the Most High, the righteous God, unattainable by humankind. However, the second God was known as Yaul the Ba'of, who also had many names, the Ogdoad, for instance, but also known as Yahweh, the Creator. That's blasphemous enough. Um, the Elion, the High God, the Monad, is the good, emanating in many ways, who is in no way, no way involved in the affairs of earth or humankind because their understanding is that earth, all creatures in it, and especially humans, were made evil. Everything on earth is evil. In the Gnostic Acts of John, there is quite an interesting long passage about how humanity was made. And in there is listed the many gods of Gnosticism, or demigods, we might say, or archons, as Paul would use. Each of these archons is listed, and each archon made a different piece of the man, the first man. Somebody made the thumb. Somebody made the thumbnail. Somebody made the thumb joint, etc. all the way through. It was a composite being made by evil entities. Paul calls them evil in high places, archons. So nothing on earth is good, and we certainly are not good, being made by Yaldabaoth or Yahweh. All things in the world are evil. The, the monad, the high, good God, he has nothing to do with this because he cannot stand evil. He cannot deal with evil. He's never known evil. So the God of the Hebrews and of the Jews and of the Christians is this bloodthirsty, highly powered entity whose body itself is entirely evil and who makes everything evil. If one is to go to the Pleroma, that is, the high heaven where the monad dwells, one must be killed, releasing the spirit, or as some of the Gnostics say, the soul, which ascends toward the Pleroma, and is tested by archons for secret knowledge as it ascends <clears throat> on the way up. If that knowledge is not known and the challenges are not met from the archons by that rising soul, then the soul is reincarnated into some lower form. I think. <clears throat> This must be where Gary gets the spouting lie that Essenes are also believing in reincarnation. I can't find it anywhere in Qumran or any other Essene literature, nor in any <clears throat> description of the Essenes by contemporaneous sources. So by throwing these Gnostic Gospels into the Qumran library, which were, by the way, written perhaps 400 years later than the Qumran stuff, there's no hint of polytheism or reincarnation in the scrolls 
or any other kind of biblical literature that I can find, I wonder, why does he do this? Why? Does Gary know his stuff? Obviously. He knows his stuff. He scrambles up unrelated texts to make Essenes to be some kind of Gnostic Kabbalists, a religion that we never have seen before. While Gary, being on the outright of Christianity, all I can figure out is that he is reformed, a reformed Christian, at least that's what it sounds like. He never so, says so. <clears throat> But such are the real polytheists with their trinity, trinity of gods, and the idea of spiritual resurrection rather than bodily resurrection. What else is reincarnation? I hope you understand. There's somebody here that is being entirely unprofessional, demeaning, and pejorative to your faith. And such needs to be addressed. This is what Yahshua and the Scripture tell us concerning confronting evil. We must confront it wherever we see it. But we are not to confront what appears to be evil unless we understand that it is. This definitely is evil. The polytheist has poisoned the pot of our faith, yours and mine, calling us a cult. And his sponsors evidently are so ignorant or so hungry for page views that they are, with him, committing a mortal sin. I believe that the prohibitions of the Ten Commandments are set out for a reason. John, 1 John chapter 5, talks about venal sins and mortal sins. I believe that the Ten Commandments are mortal sins, sins unto death, just like adultery. Adultery does not just lead to death, it leads to the death of many, soul death, spiritual death, death in this life. It's the same thing with bearing a false witness. This has nothing to do with lying, understand. In lying, there is no, nothing to witness in the first place. But here we are testifying in a court of this world about a particular peaceful, and loving people, historically uh, talked about and discussed and understood, and now this same decent, loving, together type of people is trying to be reconstituted in our age because this is what we need in the midst of all this Christian and Hebrew roots confusion. And he's bearing a complete false witness now to thousands of people in regards to the name Essene. But Essene is not Essene alone. Essene is a bucket term for numerous first and second century and AD and BC movements that were movements of righteousness, movements of zeal for the Torah, movements that were lawful and messianic. It's the same thing that we are trying to accomplish today as a new movement, a fresh movement. What I'm trying to say here is that there's something motivating this fellow. Something certainly beyond 
fame, beyond page views, beyond getting your face and word out there. This is diabolical. It's diabolical. You understand? This is something that has to be met with whatever strength of the Holy Spirit you might happen to have. This is a direct attack against we who are righteous Jews, Messianic Jews, against us from a historical attacking machine called Reformed Christianity. Do you understand? Bearing false witness to important events, literature, testimonials to the contrary, so as to try to destroy our faith and that of the 144,000 martyrs that went on before, whom we follow now. This is purposeful, systematic, and destructive. Lying on a worldwide scale, these lies go everywhere. These page views are in the thousands of thousands. And these spouting liars and everybody, everybody that is a part of getting his message out, the devil has out to destroy our movement and actually certain individuals within our movement. So here I lay out the case against polytheism and to some extent the case against reincarnation, which we'll do more of the next time I do this. But what is needed now goes beyond prayer. It goes beyond good intentions and thoughts. You go listen to what he has to say. You folk on here, 17 of you, are astute people. You've come under the teaching of Neo-Essenes, that which is modeled after the ancient Essenes. Go back to Philo. Go back to my website and read what Philo has to say of Essenes. Then go on to Josephus, if you want, and the four or five other witnesses that talk about this. Get yourself re-educated insofar as what your faith is going to be. Someday, we're going to start asking for members. We're going to say, make a commitment. We're going to be like Nehemiah. He says, build with one hand, fight with the other. We cannot get by as pacifists in this world. We have to be active against the evil one that is now coming against us, or just dissolve. We're at a stage now in the Yahad where we are unified and we are of one mind. And I can't imagine anybody in the leadership turning now. However, now it's time to unify against evil and expose it, if that's all we can do. And we can. There's not a person on here tonight that isn't totally capable of listening to his spouting lies and not being able to defend against it. But again, it's not only a spiritual warfare, but it's also a warfare of getting the message out. You know, the Yahad, since we were put together as a unit in 2016, January, 
We've existed since 2001, but 2016 is when some brave souls came together down in Florida and decided it was time to do something. And part of what we decided then to do was to come against such propaganda, nonsense, and lying as Gary Wayne and his affiliates are doing now. Now, Father has given us the call. We've had talks among the leadership about this and among many other lay members that are a part of this, whether they have declared it or not. And we have quite a long video that I call motivation or mobilization, I'm sorry, mobilization. We are put in, in, we're being put in play now as soldiers, as sons of light versus sons of darkness. No, we can't just let this thing go. It's not going to die. The word is out there, and it's out there forever. Forever. What are we to do? That's the next question. Look. We've collected a couple hundred dollars in escrow now for doing something. And that's what we're trying to do with this video and several others that we have. We have started a special YouTube channel just for this. Now, we have been told our best bet here in doing this is to... to be offensive against his message. But is that enough? Can we be offensive against the demon if we don't know his name? This is a man being used by Satan. I'm passionate about this because I'm seeing through it. He's being used by Satan. He needs to be named, and he needs to be cast out. Do you get my drift? And it can be if we're unified in our purpose. I'm just going to leave you with that tonight. However, I want to come back and do this again very soon, and address some of the other lies that this man has told in order to destroy the memory of the ancient Essenes and Nazarenes and Yahshua HaMashiach and his disciples and apostles and the 120 and all that have gone before us, giving their lives so that we could have this faith today and we must act against him. What that means, well, that's up to you. What does the Spirit tell you? What does the Spirit tell you? Huh. I'm going to share something with you that I don't make common knowledge. I was working for a mission organization some years ago. I was the executive vice president. We were working hard in a third world country to bring not only religious stability to that country, but also food, vaccinations, education on a grand scale. There was a devil that got on the board through coercion and the desire for power in a well-known ministry that this was. I was on a speaking tour. I was in Wisconsin, a little town called Broadhead, Broadhead, and I was talking to the pastor of the church 
after my lecture there in the church regarding the needs in that country. And I told him about this board member. I told him this devil has been in infiltrating us for years. Now he's the head of the board. But he's obviously put in here in order to stop our forward progress after we've got all these things done. He wants no more to evangelize. He wants no more to bring the word to the country or to feed or to do anything else but to stand still and let it go as it is. That's not in our evangelism vocabulary, the stand still. I said to him, Pastor Mert, that was his name, what do you think I could do about this? Pastor Mert said this, you can pray him dead. You hear what I said? You can pray him dead. His wife. I think she nearly threw up when he said that. Mert, Mert, don't tell him things like that. Mert said, what good is this man? He's doing no good at all. He's hindering the work of a ministry that's doing fine evangelism in this place that needs it more than anything, not to mention food and education. You know something? He was right. What good is he? The hindrance of good? What's he doing there? Why is he doing this? It doesn't make any difference. He's doing it. Book sales? I'm sure of that. I'm sure he's making lots of money out of this. But the point being here, he's the agent of the same ancient Belial, swallower, and attempting to swallow up anything righteous and new that comes out of our sacred scriptures that he neither believes nor trusts. Pray him dead? Is that the Christian thing to do? You guys bind him. Just Rush is saying right now. He's lost. Some would say, let's pray for his conversion. Sister, brother, He's converted already, I think, to the Reformed Christian faith. But most of all, he's converted to the work of Belial. I just throw that out to you. Am I going to pray him dead? I'll tell you something. An infiltrator came into my family once, and I did and he died almost immediately. Do I feel guilty about that? Not one bit. He deserved it. I'm not going to tell you any more than that, except to say, you make up your own mind. Is he doing enough damage to hearts and minds of innocent people in order to do something serious about it? Or do we, through the power of Yahweh, give him a slap on the wrist and let him go? Thank you for listening to me tonight. I'll do this again sometime soon. I think our, our next is tomorrow. I'll be preaching at 11 o'clock at our 11 o'clock service. Secret storms. Storms never last, do they, Savior? We've just come off quite a storm here. And uh, I didn't have power for five days, slept in cars, uh, slept in wherever I could that was cool. The hardest part of the thing for me was the heat. It is terribly hot down here in the house, certainly over 105 or more. The weather outside was in the mid-90s and has been. And today, the power went on 
and I am rejoicing. Look how red I am. That's from sun and wind. And I try to stay out as much as I can. But one thing I want to say to you is I want to thank you because I know you've been praying for us down here during this stressful time. I got lots and lots of notices from different people, some I hardly know, saying, we're praying for you. And what can we do? You know what a blessing that is? Hallelujah. I want to thank you for doing the same thing. You're faithful people. You'll find what to do in this situation. Amen. I'm going to look at the chat here and see if there's anything I need to do with that. No need of praying his spirit dead because he's already spiritually dead. Or he wouldn't be doing this. Yes, Liz, he knows exactly what he's doing. No doubt about it. Listening to some of his diatribe, especially about you personally, read him out. Amen. What would they do in the Church of God in Christ? Would they have an organ solo that would scare him out of his mind? All right. I don't mean to be a rabble rouser, but this is a cause that we need to get involved in. So I'm going to leave you until tomorrow morning. I'll see you at 11 o'clock and also at 3.33. Maybe we might even continue this a little bit. I hope you'll be there. Yeah. yeah. Can I pipe in? Why, of course. Well, can we just set up another meeting? I mean, you know, because everyone's here. I think that they can't. We just like next third, you know, can you schedule something now? Of course. You're in charge, Liz. Tell us what to do. No, just, just, you know, throw out the Thursday. We did, we're doing Thursday at seven one time or Thursday at nine. Let's do Thursday. Uh, All right. Time? What time? Seven? Somebody say something. Seven's good here. Good here. Seven's a little early, but I can do it. Well, okay. then let's make it at eight, and we'll chase devils. And we'll all come together and choke him out and That's read him out. Amen. Jack, for some of us that don't know this individual, is there any way you could, like, put together a short list to give us, you know, for what it is that his sure. claims are? Yeah, so I just go to YouTube, pop into the search engine, Gary Wayne, and listen to the first 10 minutes of anything he does on his scenes. You'll see that this is a, a measured and a very pointed, focused attack on Essenes in general and us in particular. Uh, okay, that's all you have to do. Okay. You won't be able to listen to more than that, I don't think. Okay, so um, Thursday at 8. Yes, the name of the new channel on YouTube. <laughs> I put it up there. I don't even know what it is. Probably Vero Yahad. Is that uh, W-A-Y-N-E? Yes. Okay. Look, uh, Brother Dwayne, we, yes. we wouldn't be unified in this if there wasn't really something going on. Look, I... I'm not this kind of person. I've held this off as long as I could. Yes, uh, Colin Hamilton has it for us. NYS TV interviews and Zen Garcia. There's lots of it on there. About Can I, let me just say for to go to Now You See TV, look for the show that he did called The Mysterious Scenes in February. Good after that. So Mysterious the scenes. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. Okay. Liz, you're the bomb. I'm going to put this up on YouTube right now.
And I thank you for coming. I will also make you aware of that Thursday meeting. I'm just trying to figure out how I can make sure I get everybody here in an email. Maybe even the, I'll tell you what, if you can, if you're able, just log something on chat. And I can look in there and I see exactly who, and then I'll send you an email, okay? Log something in chat within the next two and a half seconds. Jackson, tell us how your refrigerator was. Oh, I've not opened it yet. I just got one thing out, and that was a half gallon of milk. Didn't look so good. It stinks to high heaven, but I've been waiting till after this to tear the thing open and clean it out. You might need to get Lee over there and put Lee to work. That'll be the day. <laughs> I'll put Valerie yeah, to work. I say, Lee, come on, clean up my refrigerator. I've got uh, Susan's here. I'm going to try to get her to do it. You might should call Susan Muller. That ain't going to happen, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't going to yeah. happen. Okay, brother. I, I didn't think it was. Hey, Jack. <laughs> I tell you what, you get a you get a two by four. You can get you can get Lee in there. That'll work. Uh, Lee is just Lee will just go so far with things. I'll spray it down with nitrogen peroxide. That'll do it. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll expect you tomorrow morning before our service at 1 o'clock. That's working on Shabbat. By the way, uh, Pastor Lee is preaching tomorrow at 1, and we will also uh, get that up here too. So I'm going to preach, Lee's going to preach, and then we're going to have on the 333 Club. I can't remember what's coming up there. But something and I'm going to preach too, and y'all not going to see it though. I don't think. Yeah. It's uh, Mike. Are you on there? Are you preaching tomorrow, Mike? Oh, no, you are. Well, I was wondering if he has a service there. He might want to come on too, but he might have ate a poison mushroom or something. No, we have a ser We have a service here in Tennessee tomorrow. It's Do you? cognitive pneumatology at three thirty-three. Cognitive uh, good stuff. Great, great. Uh, I'm gonna miss it because I'm. Yeah, we have a service here tomorrow, okay. two thirty. Okay, cognitive pneumatology. We we want to put together. We've got together a very very good course to help you get certified in spiritual things. How can you do that through a course? Well, this is a uh, this is a whammy of a course. I formulated it 25 years ago. I wrote the books on it. I've never used it really until now. And now you can get certified and you can be like me and have a few letters after your name. How do you like that? Next thing you know, we'll start wearing clerical collars. All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't want to wait in on that. It's too late. Not I've already late. got. I already got my collar nice and dusted. Commander, you need a a Borg military uniform. No, we need to get him. I think we need to get him in a in a pontifical, a Roman pontifical too. I could see him <laughs> with the miter on his head and. Oh y'all, please. Oh. Leave the money. I'm digging it. Do chat. We'll do this for Coke. You got to wear white robes because that's what Gary was accusing. That makes you a white robe brother. Oh. Well, he better be careful because I might do it because I'm trying to walk this thing out for real. <laughs> Love y'all. See you tomorrow. All right. Lila Toad.